Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Restore Tomorrow. We are so excited for our guest today, Louis Phillips. Let me tell you a little about Louis. So Louis is an itinerant speaker uh, who has received his certificate from the Theological Studies of Oxford University. He was trained at OCA, which is the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. He has played a role in RZIM student ministry and with young adults initiatives like Reboot, Refresh, and the university events all across the United States, Canada, the UK, and the Middle East, which is super cool. Uh, he is most interested in the topics such as meaning, identity, and purpose as they relate to the Christian worldview, especially in the lives of students and young adults. Louis is convinced that it is essential for Christians to find ways to discuss the most controversial issues of today, but respectfully and compassionately. Louis, I love your intro, man. It says a lot about who you are. Um, we're so glad to have you on the Restored to More podcast. Thanks for being with thank, us. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel like that that intro is a, a lot more impressive than it really is. It <laughs> sounds it sounds a lot more than it actually is. So, you know, uh, but so, no, thank you. Know, you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, man. And what's so cool is we had a great chance to, for those of you who don't know, we had a chance to hang out with Louie at the uh, Sexual Discipleship Leadership Conference with Julie Slattery. And the reason why I want to have you on the podcast was because your passion for young adults and for students was just all over you, man. Like even when you mm -hmm. gave a presentation, talk about the next steps and what you felt called to do and your questions, you were so bold. I feel like we were some of the youngest in the crowd mm -hmm. and always sure. around us are like all, I mean, so many certificates and so much clinical training and, and we're sitting there like, all right, we want to learn too. And you were so bold, bro, with your questions and just, and the questions you asked, I was sitting next chair at halftime. I was like, wow, who is that guy? Cause he is very smart. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I don't know if it's smart other than maybe I'm just trained to ask good questions. Because oh, um, cool. asking good questions, it seems like I don't have the answers to it, right? So maybe I'm not that smart. I'm just asking a solid question. Um, I but no, I, that, I mean, like that's a podcast for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's what way. that's really what I do, though, for a living. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so convinced that um, to engage the heart, the mind, the soul, like mm -hmm. you go after what people are really asking. Um, and so I, I, I find it's so fascinating all throughout scripture, even when Christ asks so many questions and even when people ask him questions, he asks questions back. Like there's something about that. Um, and I always find it so important, like when doing evangelism, when speaking to audiences about uh, the, the faith and the Christian truths is like, is really getting back to them. Right. Because mm -hmm. I think if we just look at the question, you're going to you're going to miss the person behind the question. You got to realize that that question often is the is that obstacle before they see uh, Christ. And so, yeah, that's why um, my mind just goes to that. My mind immediately because I want to get to the bottom of something so that I can fully understand it to the best of my ability. So good. OK, for, so for our listeners that maybe the introduction went a little over their head and they're like, I don't know okay. what that means. What what do you do, Louie? And, and just fill us in. Give us an overview of what you're passionate about and how it's going right now. And then let's go backstory and talk about how you got to where you're at too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I, I mostly travel to university campuses, um, conferences, pretty much anywhere I'm invited uh, to come in and realistically defend the Christian worldview against people's largest objections to it. Uh, if that makes any sense. So I, I love um, going into realms where people don't agree with me. I, I, I mean, I speak on sexuality a lot. Uh, the Christian, the historical Christian view of sexuality is just not even remotely accepted today. Um, I, I find it to be biblical and true, and I want to defend it. And I think uh, going into these realms, but typically giving a very short talk, but then opening up for almost twice as much or three times as much of, of Q and a after to make sure that here's a diving platform. Here's, here's, we're going to talk about this subject, but I don't want to talk the whole time. I want to hear what are the questions you have. And so I've found it to be um, just a beautiful door for the gospel um, because so many people have these massive pre-assumptions or, or reservations for the Christian gospel because they think they already know it. Mm. And most of the time they don't. Um, they, they've watched a Discovery Channel documentary. They, they've read a blog post on this passage of scripture. They've not actually given, been given the whole view of it. And, and I'm there to just say, look, there is nothing more beautiful, nothing more profound than the Christian gospel, uh, because it's God himself actually taking your place and inviting you into a relationship with him, which is the very thing you and I want. And so just finding unique and creative ways to get into realms where people are willing to listen. But unfortunately, a lot of times I have to do it. You have to do it in a way that um, 
that earns a certain credibility uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of times people will not listen to you. So finding creative ways to enter into that conversation and helps. And, and that's why even just getting trained at the University of Oxford um, and the Oxford Center for Creative Oxford, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, it helps. But, but quite frankly, like that's not where <laughs> it's it, people that, like, oh, oh, oh my goodness, I got to listen to this person. It's like, I, I'm not an expert. I don't have a PhD in this. I don't even have a master's. In this is just something I do all the time. Um, but having those sorts of things helps uh, to enter. And so that's, yeah, that's how it's, like. it's going well. I mean, it's, there's still such a need for this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I firmly believe God's plan A is the local church. Uh, I am here to assist that. I'm here to help that, um, not even remotely try to take the place of that as a parachurch organization. Like I, I want to help the church reach a demographic of questioners maybe that they're not reaching because they're not they're not even willing to enter this the door of a church um, i feel like you're ready to get like i don't know i feel like you're opening yourself up to a dangerous place when you're like hey let's ask questions about sexuality and yeah. <laughs> i don't know i don't know about you but i'm like honestly for a long time for me i'm fine like living my christian walk i think this is probably most christians where we're fine living our christian walk and and, you know, we don't need to have answers to everything because, you know, it's God and we're never going to understand it completely. And I think we already wrestle enough with our own questions to, like, open the floor up to other people's questions about whatever it is, whether it's sexuality or it's church hurt or misunderstanding what the Bible says or the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these things are like, wait, so, like, how do you serve a God? I mean, that's what we, that's what we get a lot with people our age that are in their early 20s. Like, why would God allow things to happen to all these people why would god allow the murdering of babies and the murdering mm -hmm. of women and all these things to take place like how could i ever love or love a god or serve a god like that would you say there are specific maybe like a few questions that you get asked everywhere you go that are pertaining to certain things or is there like a certain theme that you see with young people that are asking questions or oh yeah that's a great question absolutely um so i mean doing apologetics i think you can boil all of people's questions down to like 10 or 12 okay. realistically like mm -hmm. you're there's as many questions as there are people in the world so don't sure. i don't want to diminish it in that sense but it, it really boils down to a certain like uh, this concept of justice sexuality mm -hmm. uh fairness suffering all like it, they, they all come down to a few categories and then you start yeah. reliability of scripture historicity of the person of christ like all that kind of stuff but I will say this, it does not matter what I speak on today. The first question that will come up will be, what does God have to say about sexuality? Wow. wow. So if that's not, that's why I'm so passionate about that topic specifically, because yeah. within this realm, it used to be, has science buried God? Has science proven that we don't even need to believe mm -hmm. God? Quite frankly, that is not even a question of Gen Z right now. It's just not. And when it is, I can actually engage with it for a few minutes and they'll be like, yeah, that seems reasonable. Like Gen Z is not an atheist um, it's not an atheist generation. They're mm -hmm. a secular generation, don't get me wrong, but they definitely believe there's there's some an energy, a force, a God, something out there. They do they are not like this we're alone in the cosmos, which just 20 years ago would have been the massive thing on college campuses. The vast majority are not there. Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, it's oh. I think it's I think it's just like prime real estate and, and a good time to harvest for the gospel yeah. because like now people are open and the question is okay so which deity which god mm -hmm. which which uh divine force energy i don't know how they want to uh, describe it but like i'm going to constantly push them to the christian god mm -hmm. um but yeah it's definitely definitely sexuality is number one right now uh, which isn't surprising to me at all um mm -hmm. but yeah you know. okay well i want you to share on something um since we're on that topic right now, but at the summit, you gave a talk and um, there's multiple like facets we can, we can talk about your talk, but one bold statement that you said that Clint and I always say now to each other and to other people is you were like, we are going to lose the next generation if we don't get like God's design for sexuality, like, right. If we don't figure yeah. this out, we're going to lose them. Like if we avoid the conversation, all that. Everything. Yeah. And yeah. Um, if we don't figure it out for ourselves, if we don't know how to talk about it and accept and love. And that was like so bold. Yeah. And Clinton yeah. and I were like, oh, my gosh, like we're so worried about like our generation and the generations like ahead of us. But like what is even the next generation? What are their questions and what is their point of view and worldview? And um, we've come back to like 
the people that were discipling and younger generation were like, yeah, like, you know, we're going to lose. And they're like, yes. And they like totally agree with the statement that you oh, made. Oh, 100%. Like we ran it by our oh, friends yeah. that are Gen Z. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, oh, yeah, those are all of our questions. We're like, yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm like, yeah. wow. Yeah. And, and here's where, I mean, this is where I can get in trouble with. I know it's a bold statement, but, but I mean it because the gospel is the most important thing. That's hands down. Like, I don't think there's a, there's a subject that's more important than getting to the gospel. My point in saying that is this is the largest obstacle preventing somebody from seeing the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's how I view it. It's like Christ has got so much muck and mire thrown on him. And I'm trying to clean off the lens so people can see him because he's the only one that can change someone else's life. He's the only one that can like the Holy Spirit's the only thing, only, only person that can radically transform his heart, someone's heart to, to fall in love with Christ. I don't think and I, and I think that Christians, we have elevated sexuality as a sin that it's like, well, no, no, we need to stop elevating sexuality as a whole. It's like, no, no, I agree. But what I'm, what I'm saying is when so many young people right now won't even entertain the Christian gospel because they find God's view of sexuality to be unfair mm. and they find it to be restricting and unloving. And it's really difficult for them to see the entirety of the gospel if we're not willing to address that. And that's shame on us too. I mean, we've done it wrong, flat out. I've done it wrong. Like I, I, there's, there's so much to unpack in there. But the reason why I say this generation specifically um, is because one, um, especially when it comes to LGBTQ uh, questions, um, one, we have to be very careful to not treat that community as a monolith because it's not, it's not one like homogenous group. No, it's so complicated and, and complex and intricate like we have to be very careful to say this is how lgbtq people think it's not it's not that simple but i would say in general um that argument it used to be ethereal it used to be like oh yeah the guy down the road is gay and we don't really talk that's not like we know the statistics like lgbtq people a lot of them come from religious households mm. gen z not only experience is experience this both in their, in their own families but their friends they themselves and so it used to be like oh we just have to really talk about this occasion it's like no no this is here and now it's in our homes it's in our churches um this this understanding of sexuality that's what i mean yeah. um and then the the other part of this that I, this is where i just think the churches they don't see this wave coming that i think because i have these conversations all the time that there there's, there is a wave of a progressive form of christianity coming that is very compelling and the, and the way I would describe this progressive form of Christianity is uh, it's Jesus as savior, just not Jesus as Lord. Mm. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's the very thing every single person wants. <laughs> we want divine forgiveness, yet Absolutely. we want to still, we want to say Lord of our lives. And the progressive Christian approach to sexuality and a variety of other things is just, look, honestly, God just wants you to love people. He wants you to live a good life. He really doesn't care that much about sin. This is why he's willing to die for it. All the, and it is a, it's trying to like declaw the line of Judah. That's the way I, I like to describe mm. it. They're trying to turn Christ into like a house cat. That it's just like, he's actually just a pet of yours. It's like the beauty of, the, of Christianity is that Christ is Lord and he's savior. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. And he does have things to say about sexuality. He does have, but so we have, it's the topic is here. It's, and you have a form of Christianity that no one's saying, well, no, that's not like, they're not giving a compelling answer to their, to that, sure. to that form of Christianity that's saying, you know what, actually we've just missed this topic. Um, the Bible really doesn't say anything about it. What God wants you to do is find someone you love, live mm -hmm. a good life. That's what he's interested. That's why he cares about sexuality. Cause really what he, he would never ask you to sacrifice anything. That would be too painful. God actually wants you to live a fulfilling life, a good life. Mm -hmm that's what's so compelling because i mean i say that i say that almost sarcastically but it's like do you understand that is the thing i want to eat up like as a sinful individual like i sure. just want to stay in charge of my that life sounds great. i just yeah. want to be lord totally. and this version of christian is doing that and it's specifically doing that with sexuality and that's why i'm like oh. if we don't if we don't straighten up and we're not presenting mm -hmm. a better view we're going to lose it we're going to oh. lose them to a, a, a really and it's not true it's not the christian gospel mm -hmm. it is deistic moralism it is not yeah it's just not the gospel it is it is changing and paul's just very clear in galatians like yeah. if anybody comes to you with another form of this may they be a curse to hell like if i come to you if an angel if anybody comes to you with a different form this is not true like this is the one thing and anybody that's willing to change it we have to just be careful in love but we have to defend uh, what we believe christianity yeah. says about sexuality
Well, Lou, you are on the front lines. All right, you're at these college campuses. You are seeing it face to face. A lot of us are removed. Maybe we've been graduated for a while. Maybe we're parents. We have kids being raised in this generation of this trains of thought. Yep. What would you say are are the questions that you're getting asked on a regular basis as it pertains to sexuality that maybe are believed by the masses that you're coming against and you can sense like, wow, I'm really going to head this question head on here and there's going to be some controversy. Yeah. We got to talk about it. What would you say are one of those, one or, one or two of those topics that you're talking about? It might yeah. even be the LGBTQ. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you have to address the pain mm. of those within the LGBTQ community community have faced mm. and you will be so you will sound so tone deaf if you don't just sit there and address it because like we as christians have been awful mm. to that community and now the answer is like we've been awful so now just affirm and i'm like look this is that pendulum that i just really like, stop mm -hmm. doing that address what we've done what i always tell people watch any documentary on lgbtq things watch who are the most angry people doing this most of the time they're holding a sign having a cross around their neck something they're visually christian i don't i don't know these people i'm not coming out but i will say that i've i've played a role in um misunderstanding and misrepresenting a community for sure there mm -hmm. are things about the lgbtq community that we as christians should actually applaud mm -hmm. this understanding of loving people um in a way that they feel accepted uh when i see when i see <laughs> uh parents lining up on the parade willing to offer kids hugs that then get didn't get hugs from their parents because they were gay i want to applaud that and say yes that's the gospel mm. right there's certain things that we so we have to address that but here's the we live in a time that says oh the moment you even remotely so affirmation you're folding on your conviction like stop i don't believe that for one second i see christ i mean this is what pharisees try to say to christ it's like see you're not really you're not really god you're not really or you're not really god. you're not really a religious person you're eating with tax collectors christ did this all the time he never folded on his conviction but he made people think like there were the religious elite constantly thought he was because he was doing things that they wouldn't do i'm just saying we want to applaud certain things we want to applaud like yeah um there is an understanding within scripture that we have used scripture in ways. This is the other part that I want to just apologize and just repent of like, we have used scripture to say things. It just doesn't say um, mm -hmm. the amount of times I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me saying, I was told that if I loved Christ, I wouldn't struggle with any form of my sexuality, especially if I was attracted to the same sex or I was gay. In fact, if I loved Christ, he would take that away from me. Mm -hmm. We've preached that for decades. We preach that there's no, and, and we've also preached that just even having that, even having that desire, because one, that one, that desire is not natural too, which is also, I don't know why we, we, we believe we're born sinful. We believe that you and I have desires, mm -hmm. innate desires of ours that are actually flawed and outside of his design. And yet for someone to struggle in that sense, we're like, no, that's, that's not God's design. Something happened to you. And if you look at the research, the sexual orientation is so oddly on a spectrum in the sense we don't know what actually produces it. Like, Secular scientists will say it's nature, it's nurture. We really can't. We have we have a better way of picking out your personality and and, depict, I mean, and actually uh, figuring out what your personality would be based off of genetics and, and this versus like this is how it results. Um, and we want to make sure that we're saying what scripture actually says. And so I just think we've said so many things that are not true. And we wonder why there's such a, uh, there's a community that's just like, I want nothing to do with this. Yeah. And so we're, we're in a hole is all I'd say. Like, and so like, to your, sorry, this is taking me forever to get to your, to your question. Some of those questions are like, if I'm gay, do I, does that mean I'm definitely going to hell? Mm. Why are Christians so judgmental towards LGBTQ people? Why does God really care if I, who I sleep with? Like it's, it's, those are the questions people are, are wondering. And it, part of it is because of how poorly we've done this in the past. Mm. All we've said realistically is wait until you're married it's got to be a man and woman. Here's a problem with that. It's true. That's actually, scripture does say those things, but we're giving them the most cheap, fragile version of what we believe. Because what does that say? That says the end of your sexuality is marriage. Mm. Not that the point of your sexuality is ultimately reflecting the one true marriage, right? Mm. We're cheapening it. We're in an attempt to try and like hold the forward in Christianity, we're actually cheapening sexuality and marriage and pointing it back into ourselves. And we wonder why the world is like, that's, that's just as broken as what I'm offering. And so they want nothing to do. In fact, I feel like the world is actually offering a better answer than that one. 
but they're not offering a better answer than the full God, than the full Christian mm-hmm. sexuality. That's like, sorry, I don't even know if that was coherent, but I just no, went good. everywhere. No, like, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's, that's what I said. Questions. I think that's what we see happening is that young people are being drawn to secular thinking because secular thinking one, it's more inviting to all of your questions. And then there's quote unquote, better answers. Yep. And it's not that Christians don't have the answers. It's not the Bible doesn't maybe, actually, maybe Christians don't, but it's not the Bible or God doesn't have the answers. It's that I think a lot of Christians, like you're saying, they're judgmental in the approach, they're unloving in the approach and it can, and they're not even well equipped to answer those in love with Christ mm-hmm. as the imagery or the gospel. Yeah. And so what can happen a lot of times is that we can not even understand how to have that conversation. So we just silence it with certain things that we pull from the Bible. And like you're saying, we just pull very small things, right? We don't pull yeah. the whole picture. Why yeah. don't you give us that picture of, of the whole picture, Louie? Why don't you say, you know yeah. what, man, this is what I believe. Because it makes sense that, that people, whether they're Christians or not, are being hung up yeah. on sexuality. That's what you're saying. I hear you saying that they can't even, they can't even progress. If the, if the cross is up on a hill and Jesus is on the cross, they're not even making it to the bottom of the hill because they're hung up on sexual questions. Yep. They're like, I don't even know if I can approach the cross. I don't know if I want to approach the cross yep. because from what I heard about what comes out of the cross, and really that's maybe even a, a misguided conversation about the gospel. So why don't you paint that picture for us a little about what you, what you believe yeah. and what you talk about sexuality being? Because yeah. I think you just kind of stirred some people's appetites. Well, like, what do you mean? Sexuality doesn't stop with marriage? And Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah, the end of your sex life isn't marriage. Um, so with any worldview, any, any trying to answer it, you have to start, okay, what, what is the, what's the meaning of like, what's it all about in the first place, right? Because mm-hmm. if, if, if the idea that I believe in, a, in the God of Christianity and this person believes that we all arrived from a cosmic accident, they believe we ended in oblivion. I believe we end in, in a new earth and a new earth. The odds of us lining up on sexuality, it's not even just like probably not probable, it's impossible that we're going to align on what we think sexuality is about, right? So we have to understand if, if people have to give other people the benefit out of like, explain to me within your worldview why it's consistent to what you believe, right? Because mm-hmm. what I actually think I think happens is people start with a Christian worldview, okay. weed in a secular narrative and wonder why it's not working within the Christian worldview. It's like, you, you, you have to stay consistent because it's like, mm-hmm. if, you think, if you think that there's this loving God that created you for all these things, um, just to enjoy life. And then you bring in a secular and it says, but really sexuality is just about you uh, finding yourself. And then you want to finish with this loving God. It's like, why do you not think that that God, well, one, where are you getting this concept of loving God? Cause you're getting that from Christianity. Um, but then you're not taking his words on sexuality. Cause you actually want to hear these words. It's, and the reason why you can get away with it is because most of the people haven't either. The reason why we can get away with this because the ground hasn't shaken yet. And when people's lie in their lives, when the ground shakes, that's when you start seeing where the worldview is. And if you don't have a solid foundation to your worldview, it will come crashing down. And it's the scariest thing in the world to be the very thing you believed everything to, to just break. And that's what happens when you have an inconsistent worldview. So anyway, when it comes to Christ, when it comes to Christianity and sexuality, I have to ask myself, what's it all there for the, first, what's it all? Why did God do this in the first place? What's he really saying? And mm-hmm what we have as Christians is the entire Christian like canon. We have all of scripture from Genesis to revelation. And what I think Christians love to do is they love to pick out like, so regarding LGBTQ issues, they, they have the six clobber passage. You have three in the old Testament, three in the new Testament. And they are like, this is what God has to say about sex, homosexuality. It's basically that it's like, sure, sure. But I don't even go to those because there's like, that's just giving me restrictions. I don't care about the restrictions. I want to know what the purpose, give me the vision of it. Cause then all the because the bible doesn't say a variety of things about a lot of sexual restrictions like everybody wants to say like well christ didn't say anything about homosexuality christ didn't say anything about pedophilia christ didn't actually i want to take that back that sounds like i'm comparing the two and i would be very careful that happens all the time i'm actually just anybody listening i'm sorry you're gonna hate that what i'm saying is christ didn't say a lot of things about sexual restrictions he actually gives us one restriction entirely that's my point sorry i know that can go weirdly but anyway so if you start this with the end in sight which is what we as christians are actually called to do why does paul say you, you press on you look for getting what lies at there's a this is the shortest part of our lives as christians we believe that what we're living we our lives are a vanishing vapor we are this is nothing we are here today we're gone tomorrow but there's an eternity at hand what is that eternity like? What are we doing right now to shape that eternity? Well, 
in the book of Revelation, we're very clear. It's very clear that the, the climax of it all, the climax of God's redemptive story to his people, which is what is, is the narrative with all throughout scripture, is this wedding between him and his bride, the church. Like, that's the point. That's the, that's the, the pinnacle of it all is that God is going to be with his people. And he, and he describes it as a wedding and a marriage, which again, should, that should perplex us. Like that's some weird language. Why that versus any other, why not could describe himself as King and we're his subjects, like all of those things would work, but he chooses marriage. And from there, I love going back to Genesis. And then you start, you see from Genesis, it's like, actually, you see that again, you see a marriage, you see Genesis and Genesis right in the beginning. We have a marriage there as well. Yeah. Right. You have this idea that God actually is understanding marriage to be a, a, a core theme. If the book of a book starts with a marriage and ends with marriage, it probably tells you there's something in the in between. There's a theme there going on. What's it all about? And then all throughout the Old Testament, God's constantly referring to Himself as a, a the groom. He's he, He's using covenantal language to describe like the, the entire. I mean, we see this in Jeremiah, we see this in Ezekiel, but we also see in the the entire book of Hosea is God saying. Look to me as husband. I'm going to show you that really my role here is that this redemptive husband. That's the, that's the intimacy I'm, I'm, I'm wanting with my people. Mm-hmm. But where I say everything changed for me when I started realizing, so what is the point of sex? Because if, if it's just simply about, I think most Christians believe sex is God's gift to us for that you would find someone that you love, want to spend the rest of your life with and have a family with. Mm. That's, I, you're, I think your average person would just say that, that your average Christian. And that's part of the answer, but more than that, you have to have something deeper. More than that, I think it's very clear that God is showing us that ultimately, just like everything in our lives, because we're image bearers, everything we do points to a higher truth. Everything. Like we don't, we don't even get the option of saying whether that's true. Like that's just a fact by nature of being an image bearer of his. Our sexuality ultimately is supposed to point to a higher truth our marriages are ultimately supposed to point to a higher truth and and where this gets so emphatically just pinned down and said yes this for sure is true is in the gospels when when christ is actually talking about this like why when he's talking about marriage he constantly goes back to genesis and he says don't you know in the beginning god created them to be male and then when paul talks about it too he does the exact same thing and then paul is the one that jacks it all up and says and by the way what i'm talking about is Christ and his bride. And you're like, wait, what? I thought this was about our marriage. He's like, no, 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 you're missing it entirely. Yes, your marriage matters. Yes, God cares about the intricacies of your marriage. We have books on that in the Bible that talk about it. He's like, but if you don't understand that the point of your marriage ultimately is to reflect and point to the one true marriage, you'll mm-hmm. miss it entirely. And we know that to be the truth. This is, I've, this is my point to all, all people. It's like, we know for a fact that the, the major point of marriage, the major point of your sexuality is ultimately to reflect and point to that one. We know this because in the Gospels, when Christ was asked about marriage in the end, he blew everybody's mind because he's talking to a bunch of Sadducees that don't believe there's even a a resurrection. So they're just going to mess with him. And they're asking about that one example. It's like, hey, this woman was married to this man. He died. He wasn't able to produce a child. So his brother married her. And then another brother, and then another brother. They all died. Nobody Nobody had a kid. Which one is she married to in the end? in the afterlife. And they're just trying to say, look, the afterlife doesn't exist in the first place. But he's like, you're wrong because one, you don't know the power of God nor the, nor scripture, which is also interesting because he's a religious elite that would know scripture. Because um, he says, in the end, there is no marriage. That one should, that should perplex all of us because it's like, well, wait a second. If this thing is this good thing, if this, why, why would we not have that? Because I still have a body. Yeah, totally. Like, I still have a body. It looks like I'm still going to eat so much of what life is about. It's like, it's still there. Why isn't marriage? And, and this is where I go again to this idea that everything we do is points to higher truth. We know from the old Testament to the new that animal sacrifices were to atone for sin. Right. But we also learned in the new Testament that and they never actually atoned for sin. They were pointing to the one sacrifice that would atone for sin. And this is why as Christians, the moment Christ was slain on the cross, the lamb slain before the foundation of earth, right? The lamb of God that was take away the sins of the world. Once that happens, we're not sacrificing animals anymore because all those things, all those sacrifices were trying to just point to this. They were just signposts pointing to this one. So we don't do it anymore. In the same way marriage, our marriages are supposed to be a signpost. They're supposed to be, this is a very temporary thing that in the end, once there's, once Christ consummates his marriage with his bride, there's no more marriage. There's only one. And it's not the way you and I think it is. And that's a beautiful thing. 
And here's the reason why I think that's so beautiful today is because it, it tells us all, one, this, this thing that you've been told, like your ability to express yourself sexually or sexually, this thing that to find a commitment, that that's going to be the end all be all to your life, that this is the most important thing. You know, scripture says, no, it's a mm-hmm. good thing, but it's not the end all be all. And in fact, I think that's what's so frustrating too, because within Christianity, you see, you see marriages that are like, oh, that's hard. Like that's difficult. Like this is not the thing that satisfies me. I still struggle. I mean, as something I'm not married. I'm just doing the conversation. I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time. You're still not satisfied. Like your marriage does not satisfy you. Why? Because it never was supposed to. Is it supposed to be good? Is it supposed to be God honoring? Is it supposed to remind you of his marriage? Absolutely. But marriage is marriage is not supposed to fulfill you. It's supposed to point you to the relationship that will. And singleness is supposed to point out that you and I are not sufficient in ourselves. But we have now believed this lie that actually marriage is the pinnacle. And then we tell a whole group of people they can't have it. Mm. No wonder why we're missing it. Mm. Now that's hard too, because all of society is saying you need this as well. So it's, it's two narratives there. But we as Christians should have been saying, well, wait a second. No, the end all be all, the, the point of my sexuality is not necessarily marriage. It's also ultimately in this intimacy with God. Because the most intimate relationship, the, the most intimate relationship you can have with a person be in like, it, most intimacy I think you can have with somebody. Yes, sex can produce that, but you can have a lot of intimacy and no sex, and you can have a lot of sex and no intimacy. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not they're not hand in hand in that sense, because you. But there is something God is saying something very beautiful about it, because the intimacy between one man and one woman in the context of marriage is ultimately supposed to point to the intimacy he has with us. So there is something powerful there, right? So if the pendulum has the ability of saying marriage is pointing to the most beautiful thing God has ever said will ever happen. Well, no dud has the ability of swinging all the way over here and being one of the most harmful things we've ever dealt with too. Mm. Because every single one of us walk around with a sexual brokenness and shame that we don't like talking about. And that's even talking about people that, that are, that that haven't slept around that. We all have a, like, and this is the other part where Christ just levels the playing field. Matthew five, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, anybody that committed lustful intent in your heart will have already committed adultery. Mm. We love, my friend Sam Albury says, we love to hear that scripture and think of it as a negative because they're like, ah, that seems harsh. Like, shoot, like, I guess so I'm, so I'm an adulterer. And he is saying that. He is like, we're all in the same playing field. Every single one, no one's ever lived that one out fully. But if you reverse it and you actually see the thing when he's saying, what Christ is saying is that he, he values you so much. He values your, your whole personhood because we understand sexuality to be involved in all of who we are. Your whole, your whole person is so valuable to him that it's not okay for someone to violate you in the privacy of their minds. Mm. Like that's what Christ is saying. I love you so much that it's, I don't even approve of, if somebody wants to violate you in their own mind, I don't allow it. That's how much I care for you. Like mm. that's powerful. No other worldview even remotely says that your sexuality matters that much. Like that's, that's the beauty of it. And so I just want people to see the narrative is this is the end. Mm. And we do it with everything else, but for some reason, marriage, we don't. And after you see that, here's what's really cool. Then we can start talking about procreation. Then we can start talking about commitment. Then we can start talking about romance. Yeah. So procreation doesn't make a lot more sense that in the, the coming of, to the coming together of one man and one woman in the context of marriage, that life can be produced. If the whole point of this is that in, in Christ, there is only like, only in Christ, do we have life? Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's again, it's pointing more through the Trinity. Does life come forward? Like it, even commitment, Christ says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet marriage is about to be, I will not leave you nor forsake you in this earth. Like, like, and then even romance, like Christ says, he woos his bride, like all through scriptures, he's wooing his bride to him. And this is where like, so all of those things, we don't, we don't say these things don't matter. We just say they've actually been elevated. They're actually more powerful now that now that we have a foundation that is deeper than ourselves. But if we keep, if we keep sexuality and marriage, ultimately about romance and you finding, finding a companion that you spend the rest of your life with, like we'll miss it. And we will cheapen the real view of, of Christian marriage. Sorry. That was a really long answer. That was awesome. for you asked for it. <laughs> that was great. Louis. No, that was amazing. I'm so glad you shared that. And I think, um, I think you touched on a couple of things that are, that are, very like eye-opening and could be like life-altering for many Christians. Do you want to say something? I did. I have a question. Um, yep. How would you recommend 
a marriage couple living that like what you're talking about mm. out. Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody's ever actually asked me that, which is frustrating because I feel like that should be the question. Um, I think one way is the way you treat and love singles. And that might seem like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, um, with the way that you and your, your husband or you and your wife live your life, is it all about you two and your family or do you actually involve, allow it to involve other people? Mm. And that seems hard. I, I, I mean, I say this as a single man, as I like somebody that's not, not married yet. I know that's hard. I'm the youngest of six kids. I got five older siblings. All of them are married. I have 13 nieces and nephews. I understand family is complex and there are seasons of life where you really do have to devote your time to your family. I'm not trying to take away from that whatsoever. But do, pe- do people look at you in your marriage and say, man, I want to be married? Or do they say, man, I want to know Christ? Mm. Like that should be the question. Do the way that you two love each other, are you constantly pointing others to Christ? Are you pointing them to your, your relationship? Are they envious of like, oh man, they really love it. And, or are you trying to show them over and over again? Like, oh my gosh, my, my relationship with my husband is amazing, but man, he doesn't, he doesn't satisfy. No, only Christ. That's the way I think. It, and, and I think some people are actually wrestling with that to be actually, is that true? Mm-hmm. So if you, if you find that to be convicting, that's okay, but deal with that. Like if you're telling me that your husband now, and there's a complexity there. You are one flesh. There should be an aspect of like, no, there's something. It feels like there's a part of me in this person. I understand. That's why it's so powerful. But ultimately, your fulfillment is supposed to come from God himself and not from this other person. And this person should, if anything, remind you that Christ is supposed to fulfill you. That's what should be so fulfilling about a relationship, mm-hmm. a, a Christian marriage, is that the person that you're prone to find your identity in is actually the one pointing you to Christ. And you're doing the same thing, right? That's a marriage. So like when I see... It sounds terrible. There are very few marriages in, in my life that I've ever seen that, mm. but there are some that I have, and it is nothing short of astounding and beautiful. Mm. It's like, yes, it's like, so they, they hold on to their marriage. So like, I actually heard, um, I was just like listening to an interview with like Francis Chan and he was talking about his marriage and like, he's like, I think I have an amazing marriage. He's like, in fact, I think it's unfair how good my marriage is, but my relationship with God doesn't even compare with my wife like doesn't even like it's at any day it's like jesus any day like and he's like and again we don't have a bad marriage he's like we community we love each other he's like but nothing compares to jesus that's the kind of stuff that i think if people would see that in your relationship and look we're never going to do that perfectly it's not it's not about holding that it's just about like are you pointing others to your like it's hard when everything about our instagram everything about our it's just about this one image of life. And I, I mean, one thing I always tell to married couples is like, do you, do you invite singles in your life or do they, or like truly invite them in? Like you, you think about this and even just adult singles, cause it's actually my age single is actually kind of easy, right? I'm still 30. Like it, things can still happen. What about the 40 and 50 year olds that never got married? Do they have any family in the church? Like, do they, do they have anybody that really says, no, no, you are part of our family. Cause mm-hmm. realistic, they may not actually have anyone. And this is where the body of Christ, like, this is where Christian married couples can actually be like this, 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 this lady who's been going to our church for 30 some years and has no family in the area. She's actually in our family. She's the, she's the designated aunt. She's the designated grandma that my kids don't have. And she is part of like, when we have dinners, she's there. When we go on vacation, she's coming. Like that's the kind of, if you stop seeing your family, your marriage as in protect it as like this. And I think this is very, very, um, american right now it's like even our back i mean our 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 yards are we have a fence around them we don't this is my family i'm gonna protect it don't involve like on christmas morning i just want it to be with my family i I don't no are you involving other people is your do you see your your family as opportunity for the gospel to be seen because of the you invite more in or is it because if you if you do that you're just showing other people how important that one is Mm-hmm. how this how this is the, the end all be all but mm-hmm. i want to think about it more i, I really appreciate the question but like that's that's the thing i would say is like yes are you are you constantly showing people that your f- yeah maybe the easy this is to be the sum are you constantly showing people that your family is ultimately the body of christ and not just your immediate husband and kids mm-hmm. yeah. or wife and kids that's that would be the most important thing to me because ultimately 
that is what we're supposed to be pointing people to is the body of Christ as a whole and not our immediate families. So good. Yeah, I was just- But I am, I am saying that completely ignorantly as a single man. Like I, and I do want to emphasize that. I don't think, I mean, I think we both have things to learn. Like married people have something to say to me, but I, as a single guy, I have something to say to married, married people. And this is why the body of Christ matters. But mm-hmm. I do realize I'm speaking completely out of inexperience there because I understand that's difficult. Because mm-hmm. um, sometimes you just don't have time in the day and kids are exhausting. Mm-hmm. Like the last thing you're thinking is like, how do I point people to Christ? Like, I just want to survive the day and not hear my child. Um, but I was just at a conference two weeks ago and there was a speaker and, um, she's a single gal. She's in her, she had just turned 40 and mm-hmm. she's talking about how like her whole desire, like her single life was getting married. And mm-hmm. she went to Christian colleges to like find the one she's like, man, God, like what is going on? And, um, she's like, churches don't know what to do with single adults. Mm. She was like, I would walk in and I would feel so awkward and so alone and filled with shame because I didn't have somebody to worship with next to me or to pray with or to learn with. And she was like, just like talking from this convicted stance and granted she got married like a week ago in her forties, but the whole point of it was like, talking about what you're talking about is like the pinnacle Mm. is a relationship with Christ and I think we're missing it as a church if we don't even know what to do with singles as adults. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, and, that, and that's a good litmus. Set. I mean, that's the thing I always tell churches. It's like, if you want to know if your church is doing, if you want to know if your places, your church is going to be a place where LGBTQ people are welcome, ask your adult single people what it's like to be in your church. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you real. And I, again, I mean, even older than me, typically like, yeah, 40s, 50s. What, what does it feel like to be a single in your church? Because every... February, you're going to talk, we're going to do a marriage seminar, a marriage series, but you're not going to talk about singleness at all because singleness is the weird stage before you get into real life. And then if there is a singleness ministry, the entire goal of that singleness ministry is to find your spouse. Yeah, I can feel like that. Like it's like single and still mingling. I mean, and uh, my challenge when I'm talking mingling, to young people, right? yeah. I just want to, I'm trying to challenge young people. I'm like, leverage your singleness. Mm. Odds yeah. are many of you will be married. I'm not saying, but like, are you using your single, like, Ask a married person. Once you get married, you have other responsibilities. There are more things. And it's not that your, your ministry ends, but your singleness ministry ends once you get married. Mm-hmm. And there's now a new form of ministry with one person. But like, there is something that God can do with you right now. And I've, I've loved, I'm, I'm currently dating. And it's so funny to me. Like one of my, one of my best friends is same sex attracted. And I remember talking to him like, I actually was like, when I started dating, even it was a phenomenal relationship and it was something I really felt like the Lord, I've already wrestled with whether I was going to be single the rest of my life. Mm. Um, just because I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. And I really said, I, I, I will do this. Cause he's just proven himself. I've been single for 29 years of my life and I've loved it. I've loved watching God use, like there are just certain things God could do with me. Cause I was single. And I'm like, yes, this is amazing. And I never felt a lack of fulfillment because I've had Christ. And I mean that, like, I try to tell people, it's like, he really is the bread of life. Like nothing else. I promise you that everything else is a cheap lie. He is the bread of life and he will satisfy you. If you're willing to give him everything and just say, have it. But like, I was just talking to my friend, like I was grieving singleness first mm-hmm. four, four or five months of my dating. Like truly, and not because wow. what I had was bad. It's like, I just lost something good. Yeah. yeah. I might've gained something good, but I really did. And there's a part of me that's like, ah, did I do enough? Did I, did I leverage it long enough? Did I, did, did I Lord, did, is there anything else you wanted me to do in that? And it's like, I don't think any young Christian feels that like is being taught that. And again, I don't claim like all some, <laughs> some divine wisdom. I think part of it was God gave me a certain, and predisposition and, and, and a way to just go about life and being very content in him mm-hmm. again having five older siblings and seeing marriage up close you realize yeah there ain't no way that's going to satisfy me not because it's bad it's just like there's just no way like yeah. i'm so flawed and they're so flawed. like i had that experience where i think a lot of people just don't maybe they're the oldest in their family like no i gotta do this and i got all this pressure from everybody to do it so when i start seeing i'm like no there's no way that's going to satisfy me but it's good. And, and we need to show that I just want young people, especially in college, like 
don't be so quick to get married. Do what God asked you to do. Don't get me wrong. Some some people are. I mean, you be you're a great example. You guys got. I mean, you got four kids or three kids already. Three kids got married at twenty two. Yeah. Good lord. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great example. It's like really early and whatever. Look at the look at God using yeah. your. So I'm not. It's not about not getting married young. I'm just saying, in those time frame when you are single, in that time frame when you are, are you using your singleness or are you just trying to get out of that time period? And if you, if, if the reason why you are is because you feel incomplete, you feel like a lack of fulfillment. My challenge to you as a Christian is like, you better address that now because you're only going to bring that crap into marriage. You're only going to want then your spouse to do that for you. And they can't get the fulfillment that Christ offers you right now. So that when you do go into marriage, you're like, no, this is not my savior. This is, this is the one God gave me to wreck this world for his kingdom. Not the one that's going to save me. He's done that already. I want to walk alongside this person ultimately to point more people to the gospel. Not so that it makes me feel like, mm. I don't know. Sorry. That was another, that was great. Yeah. but like, I just want people to love singing this. Cause it's like, ah, like it's yes. so good. And it's, and we go, and here's, but we also have to have, have the compelling singleness. If we're ever going to convince our LGBTQ friends that, Hey, there is life yeah. after this. If you say no mm-hmm. to ultimately saying, you know, God, you've designed it, that it just sex is ultimately between one man and one woman. And that's okay. Because guess what? This isn't even the end all. Mm. and and look i may never get a family because of that and then there are examples of like mixed orientation what are marriages like jackie hill perry and others so like i don't even i don't know what the answer all i'm saying is like there's only one realm for sexual activity within christianity and that's one man one woman in the context of marriage husband yeah. and wife and what i hear you saying okay even more than you want them to love their singleness is to love jesus yes Whether you yes. are a married couple <laughs> yeah. or single and make sure you're living your life for the sake of the gospel more than anything else. Louis, it was awesome to have you on the podcast, man. Yeah. You posed some incredible questions. I know, I know for a fact, married couples and singles are going to be greatly challenged in an encouraging way. Like you took what you did in the intro and you talked about hard topics, but you did it respectfully and with compassion. And I thought that was awesome, man. So like, thank, thank you, you so much bro, for being with us. How can, how can our listeners get to know what you're doing? Is there a website? I know you're in transition, uh, starting yes. some stuff right now. How can, how can our listeners follow what you're doing, man, and what you're up to, and even invite you to speak to different conferences and things like that? Yeah, so I am in between organizations and I'm working for, so I can't give you, um, I can give you my email and my, I have two social media handles, but I'll be honest, this year, I kind of went on hiatus and I just don't know if I'm going back. Sure. It just wasn't good for me to, all I wanted was for people to look at my life and want it. And I'm like, that's sinful. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm working on that one. I realize if I want to do ministry, I need to have something there and I'm hoping to, to work on that. But like, I still have my, my Facebook and Instagram open so that I can get received messages. So I'm actually, I have a speaking engagement this week that came through Instagram through Stuart college. And yeah. so like that, so my Instagram handle would be lou.phil.life. I have Lou, yeah. P H I L. Um, and then my name on Instagram is Lewis Anthony Dominic Phillips, because that's my full name. And so it, it sticks out, but I would get, how about my email? My email, should I, do you, is that what you want me to say? Like actually tell people. Well, this is great. We're going to tell you. The show okay, great. As well. Okay, so, so it's, yeah, L-O-U dot A as an apple dot D as in dog dot Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S at gmail.com. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I would love, if anybody, if I said anything that maybe you're just angry, you're like, I hate it, give me more time to explain. I'll either make you more mad or hopefully we go further and <laughs> give you <me> some clarity. <laughs> oh, the gospel's offensive, just flat out. It's going to perturb you. Like if you can indifferently, if you can listen to the gospel and be indifferent, I just don't think you've heard it. Mm-hmm. It should either force you to worship god or you want to run from it because it's assaulting um and so it's this thing on sexuality so i'd love to hear from anybody um that if you wanted to talk more i'm always down to have these conversations 